Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 153rd episode of the Joe Mays and J-Raff Show. I am your host this evening, Joe Mays, as uh, Justin Raffoff was unable to join me this evening, so I'm, I've got a little fill-in here. He probably can do about it as well as Justin does, So, here, um, but this guy's here probably a little less hairy than my normal co-host. Uh, say hi here, bud. This is Forrest, and uh, he really needs to get out of my way right now, though, so let's do that. I'm sure he'll be back. Yeah, here he comes. But anyways, again, welcome to uh, the 153rd episode of the Joe Mason JRF Show. I'll be flying solo this evening, so it probably will be a little bit faster show than normal as uh, I'm not great at talking with myself. And because of the setup without a second person here, we won't have the normal uh, interactive show in terms of the call-in opportunities as uh, we'll be using my phone to call into the Blog Talk Radio software. So... We're not able to take calls this evening, but you can still contact the show uh, through the social media and email. I'll throw that stuff up here on the screen right now so you can pick that up. Um, A lot of different ways to contact us if you'd like to send me an email, if you'd like to talk about any of the things we're going to be covering here. Um, Again, it's going to be all football this evening as is normal for the fall. Uh, but the best ways to contact us, obviously, through the Maze Sandwich Shop email inbox. That's at JoeMazeAndJRaff at gmail.com. Again, that's JoeMazeAndJRaff at gmail.com. And then the social media are also great ways as well. Facebook and Twitter, which I have up right now. I'm looking at them as we as I speak here. If you have something to say about... Um, any of the topics I talk about this evening or any suggestions or comments at all, definitely hit us up Facebook fan page on there and well, as well as on Twitter at Joe Mays and J Raff. Okay. So we don't have, uh, like I said, we don't have J Raff here with me this evening. Uh, he was feeling a little under the weather, also busy with water polo. I, I, while I'm speaking about water polo, talk a little bit about Wilson here. And the girls' water polo team competed uh, in the state tournament this weekend. It was at home. It was at the Roy Snyder Natatorium. uh, Recently finished, refurbished, a wonderful new pool for Wilson School District in West Lawn. So the girls were hosting the girls' title tournament this weekend. They were able to place third. They they finished third in the state, which is a great, great run for them. Uh, State championship. Um... I believe was between, was it North Allegheny and Governor Mifflin, or North Penn and Governor Mifflin? I'm not sure, but Mifflin finished second. Whichever of the Norths they play uh, ended up winning the title. And the boys' tournament, of which Justin Raffoff is, is a part of as an assistant coach for the Wilson team, and our basketball analyst, Adam Filer, he's the head coach of the Wilson uh, boys' water polo team. They have their state tournament next weekend. I will be... Uh, Friday, November 7th, and Saturday, November 8th, I believe. That is at North Penn. So uh, good luck to those guys. If I forgot to say something at the end, good luck to my co-hosts, Justin, and our our basketball analyst, Adam, as they prepare their team for uh, the 2014 PIAA Boys Water Polo uh, Tournament next weekend. And uh, speaking of Wilson, I think as we've done the last few weeks, we've talked a little bit about the Bulldogs football team, and I think we need to do so again here. This was the end of Week 10 in uh, Pennsylvania football, and in this area, at least for District 3 teams, that means the end of the regular season, and uh, we're looking ahead now to the district playoffs. Uh, if you can recall from the last few weeks, Wilson had been undefeated. Last time we had a show, they had just wrapped up a victory over Mannheim Township on October 17th. A hard, hard-fought victory against a team that was challenging them for the Lancaster Lebanon League Section 1 title. They beat Township 28-14 to that Friday. Well, last Friday, uh, the 24th, the weekend that we didn't have a show... Uh, Wilson traveled to Millersville University, the home of the Penn Manor Comets, a team that has really battled Wilson the last few years, probably been their toughest out in Wilson's uh, trek towards another section title over the last few years. Ever since really 2009, Penn Manor has come on and has really given um, Wilson some battles in the regular season and in the playoffs. Uh, this time, though, probably not as strong a team as they've had the last two years, and despite a, a great start from them, uh, Tyler Spangler 
rumbled 75 yards on Penn Manor's first offensive play to give them a touchdown. The uh, Wilson players you know, just came back, did what they had to, and it, you know it wasn't an easy win, but in the end, the 28 to seven victory over Penn Manor two weeks, two Fridays ago, was kind of a a nice statement there after being down and being without a few starters. Uh, junior tailback Shane Dantzler, who also plays a little defensive back, missed the game, as did junior wide receiver safety John Fox. They both missed um, with uh, either concussion symptoms or an illness, depending on who you talk to and what's being bandied about. Then, just two nights ago, uh, Friday, October 31st, Halloween evening, Wilson traveled to Warwick to wrap up the year, sitting at 9-0 and against a Warwick team that was 2-7. and they just they always seem to bring their A game against Wilson. They did two two years ago when Wilson was eight and one, but trying trying to wrap up their fifth straight LL title. You know this was 2012, the year with uh, some stalwarts and Jonathan Joseph, who is uh, or excuse me, Junior Joseph. I'm thinking NFL Jonathan Joseph, Junior Joseph, who um, is actually uh, playing linebacker now at the University of Connecticut. Uh, Matt Rothrock, who's playing. Uh, college football as well a few other a lot of other big names on that team in 2012 that went to the final four in the state they went down to Warwick went to Lidditz Pennsylvania and I believe at halftime they only led seven nothing again Warwick wasn't any good but uh, Wilson just seems to struggle that last game of the season on the road in Warwick every other year and this year was no different Wilson led at halftime in this one six to two uh, they were able to score a touchdown early. Looked like you get the ball rolling, no big deal. They botched the extra point. Then they get stopped, and a, they, the Warwick's able to force a safety when the punt goes over the punter's head. More injuries creep up, but once again, Shane Dantzler and John Fox didn't play. Neither did um, uh, center the center Copeland, or I believe another person was held out. I'm trying to think now off the top of my head. Can't think of it, but during the game, we suffered some injuries as well. Uh, junior linebacker, quarter, backup quarterback, and punter, uh, Jake Klein, left the game. So did junior wide receiver and defensive back, Jake Gaiman, left the game. There was a lot of injuries. I know uh, senior quarterback, Jake Templin, took a hit to his hand and was pretty swollen. He was able to finish the game. And Wilson was able to eke out a victory over Warwick down in Lidditz, 19-2. to So not exactly a dominant victory, one that was expected probably about a month ago, kind of how they beat Conestoga Valley 61-14. to I think people were expecting that against a Warwick team that was 2-7 and and uh, had actually gotten beat by Conestoga Valley and just really hadn't put up a fight. One of Warwick's victories was against Ephrata, who didn't win a game all year. But the Warwick kids, I mean, to give them some credit, they were pumped up, ready to go. They wanted this game. They played well for most of the game. But eventually, uh, the Wilson talent just wore them down, and they eked out of there with a 19-2 victory. What does that mean? Well, it means that Wilson finishes the season 10-0. and And, well, that's not a huge surprise over the last few years. We've gone accustomed to them winning 10 games. The biggest thing is that with that victory, Wilson has their second consecutive 10-0 and regular season. Of course, what does that matter? Well, it's important because this was the 70th season of Wilson football. That had never happened before in program history. Never has a Wilson team finish undefeated in the regular season in back-to-back years. It's kind of crazy to think about it. I know a lot of people have thrown out that statistic. Um, uh, Reading Eagle, people online, on Facebook and stuff. I think I'm the one that pointed it out, not to toot my own horn, but I pointed out about... I think three weeks ago, maybe after uh, either the CV win, the win over Conestoga Valley or the win over Manheim Township, I said that this team has an opportunity to do something that's never happened before. And they were able to do it, 10-0 and back-to-back season. So congratulations to the coaching staff, to the players, and for all that involved. That's the 12th perfect season in, in Wilson history. It also wraps up a untied um, section championship, the seventh straight one like that. Wilson's won seven consecutive Lancaster Lebanon League Section 1 titles. None of them have been shared with anyone. So that breaks Lancaster Catholic's record, I believe. I think they had six in a row, but one of them was a was a, a share of a title. Wilson's is now seven straight, all alone, by themselves, in the record book. That's, I believe, their 28th league title in 70 seasons. Just a lot of milestones going around. 
But all that is meaningless now because what's up next is more important. And that would be the District 3 title that they're they're angling for. It would take four more wins to secure a uh, District 3 title. It would be their second in three years and third trip to the title game in the last four. But there's a lot to uh, get, get through before arriving in Hershey the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend. Up first will be Carlisle, who finished the season 5-5. Five and five. They play in mid-pen. And while 5-5 five and five doesn't sound that exciting, and a lot of times early round playoff games, especially in the wide open 16-team field that is District 3, usually not very competitive. The top you know, seeds 1-4 through four usually have an easy time. I definitely don't think that's the case this year. This Carlisle team is very good. They run a spread option, or excuse me, spread offense that is um, has been pretty deadly. They just beat up on Harrisburg, who's in the District Three playoff field as well. They beat Harrisburg, who I think is the 13th seed, 41 to nothing. That was at their home field and all that, but you know Harrisburg is usually an extremely explosive, athletic team that can put up points, and they shut them out and. Sc- had 41 points scored on them so Carlisle definitely not a, a pushover an easy team to uh, take down it's a tough matchup for Wilson in the first round uh, being the number one seed overall in district three in quad a they'll take on Carlisle this Friday November 7th uh, seven o'clock at Gursky Stadium so very excited about that one to be back in the district playoffs should Wilson beat Carlisle they would face the winner of Mannheim Township a team that they beat once already this year but Probably gave them their toughest game, definitely in the league schedule. And um, it's hard to say. Governor Mifflin, Central Dolphin, East and Central Dolphin were all tough games, non-league games. Mannheim Township was easily the most difficult league game that Wilson faced this year. And they may have to play them right away in the second round should they beat Exeter. Now, I know a lot of Wilson people are hoping that Exeter is able to go to Mannheim Township and, and win as the nine seed so that we can play them in the second round should we beat Carlisle because of the Berks County rivalry. We don't get to play the Berks County schools unless it's a non-league game because we don't play in the um, inter- Berks Inter-County League. But a lot of um, students and family and friends in and around Exeter and Wilson, I think, would be drooling at the opportunity of being able to play each other in the second round should each of us win. And uh, I'm not going to even look any farther than that. It's pointless to do that because that would mean we're two two wins in, and we got to take it one week at a time. Up first this week again, Wilson hosts Carlisle, and that is this Friday night at Gursky Stadium. So good luck to the Bulldogs on that. And I think, oh, let's point out a couple facts here. The quarterback Jake T- Jake Templin had two touchdown passes Friday evening at Warwick. That gave him 22 for the season. Now, why is that significant? Well, he needs just one more this year to tie the Wilson program record for touchdown passes in a season. And again, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. That's held by some guy named Chad Henney. I don't know, maybe you heard of him. But that's pretty significant for you know a se- one season starter to be able to come in, uh, replace uh, Matt Timochenko, who's playing at Lehigh University, who was a full year plus starter for the Bulldogs. Uh, Templin w- played two games last year in place of Timochenko, who had <clears throat> uh, mono and wasn't able to play for two games. But Templin comes in. First year as a full-time starter, not a replacement, and throws 22 touchdown passes in 10 games and will likely tie or surpass Chad Henney, uh, who was a senior, his senior football season was the fall of 2003 at Wilson. And uh, that's when, that's a year after he threw uh, 23 touchdown passes as a junior in the 2002 football season, which just so happens to be my senior year. Uh, where we went 11-1 and and lost in the district final to uh, Central Dolphin. So I am not sh- can't think off the top of my head if there's any more in- interesting stats to point out. I, having missed the last two weeks, Shane Dantzler hasn't gotten to 1,000 rushing yards yet this season. He'll have that opportunity against Carlisle, where I believe both Shane Dantzler and John Fox will return to play in the first round of the uh, district tournament. And uh, Dantzler needs 50 yards to top it. He's 
depending on what site you use, I've seen he, that he has 939 yards, I've seen 950 yards, I've seen like 956. He needs somewhere around 50 yards to eclipse 1,000 uh, rushing yards this season. And I think that's probably it for the Wilson talk. Covered a lot of stuff here with the Bulldogs, and we'll continue to talk about them even once their season ends, whenever that could be. If things work out the right way and they're able to do something that no team in Wilson history has done um, and get to 16 wins, their season actually wouldn't end until like December 14th or something like that. So there's a there's the potential to have six more games, including this Friday, the first round of districts against Carlisle. All right, probably going to touch a little bit here on, on Penn State just because it's been two weeks and we've had two games and unfortunately it's been two losses for the Nittany Lions. One of which Justin and I were both at, if you recall, when we were last on the air, we said that we were going to Happy Valley for the Penn State-Ohio State game, which we did and was a great time. We got to uh, hang out with uh, my cousin and uh, one of Justin's uh, roommates who were actually, we're talking a little bit here, maybe we will have to get a new segment on um, with uh, Justin's college roommate. He's a suffering uh, Cleveland sports fan and he's ecstatic that LeBron James is back uh, in town. And he was regaling us about his uh, journey to get Cavs season tickets before LeBron James decided to return home uh, and going in with a bunch of guys to get them and how expensive they were and how they're making their money back. And we decided that maybe we'll come up with a, a new segment of the Joe Mays and J-Raff show called the uh, the JV Report, as uh, his name is uh, Joe V. So you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in contact with him, see if we can get him on the air here to talk a little um, yeah, Cleveland sports and how it feels to be uh, in suffering for so long, and, and LeBron, James, LeBron James coming back, which uh, is always an interesting topic here. As you know, Justin and I both share differing views. One of the few times that happens, we don't often disagree with one another, and maybe that's why you know sometimes people don't tune in, and uh, because we're always agreeing with one another, and that's not good for ratings. You know, Justin and I need to go back and forth with each other, which we don't. But we're pretty level-headed about sports together because we generally tend to agree. But LeBron James is one of those people that that has people on. on you're either you either like him or you hate him. There's pretty much no in between. And and uh, Justin and I like to go back and forth with that. One of the few things that we do. So, but anyways, Penn State. So it was a good time up in Happy Valley. Um, the four of us. Had had good seats, got to see all the all the, the team arrive on the buses, got to hang out in, up in the seats, looking down. Great great vantage point of the game. You know, disappointing first half, down seventeen nothing. Great performance at halftime by the Blue Band. They we went channel surfing with them, and they touched on things like Star Trek, Family Guy, Friends, I Love Lucy, and uh, did an interesting Game of Thrones take, um, which they talked about it as Game of Thon, which again is the uh, largest. Uh, student-run philanthropy in the world that the money goes to the Penn State Hershey Medical Center to, and the Four Diamonds Fund to help fight pediatric cancer. So great halftime. And then the second half started, and Penn State showed some life, and we got to see a, a pick-six return for a touchdown. And um, then the offense finally came alive. We got to be able to get another score. They came alive at the end of the game as well. The last drive went down the field, kicked the field goal, tied the game, went into overtime, scored – the first part of overtime, but then things kind of went downhill from there. When the score was 24-24, or 24-23, and Ohio State kicked their extra point, Penn State got called for leaping, of all things, um, and uh, gave Ohio State, on their next possession down at the other end zone, the ball at like the 12-and-a-half yard line, where they only took two or three plays to score, and then... Uh, the Penn State offense got blitzkrieged on the next series, and Hackenberg got sacked on fourth down, ending the chance for Penn State to win. Um, so the final score was 31-24, Ohio State. Uh, the offense for Penn State was downright awful. They, they woke up in time near the end of the game, but, I mean, they really did nothing for the first three quarters. The Maybe the more interesting thing to note was just how awful the coaching was from Urban Meyer and the Ohio State staff. Now, I mean, their defense play, played well enough, obviously, to win. And, I mean, you know, the Penn State offense has been terrible this year. I don't know how much credit you can give to the Ohio State defense. But the Ohio State offense and the play calling and execution by some of their 
staff and players is just mind-boggling. But, I mean, I don't really care as a Penn State fan. And the Big Ten is such a mess that I don't even really want to root for Ohio State at all. But seeing some of those play calls and, and the interactions on the sideline, it's just really, really weird to see Urban Meyer kind of seem befuddled or out of it. Maybe they just thought they could... Uh, you know, walk through this one, go through the motions and sneak out of Happy Valley with the win, which is what they ended up doing. Um, I don't, do I really want to talk about the official 80? I don't know that I do. Now that it's two weeks ago and Penn State's lost again, I don't know. That just all kind of seems hollow now talking about the blown officiating calls, but I'll recap it just for, you know, posterity's sake. First, first drive for Penn State, Hackenberg threw an interception after moving on to about midfield, although it wasn't an interception, clearly shown on the replay. Replay officials said they had technical difficulties, some malarkey like that, and you couldn't get a proper angle, so the ruling on the field stood, which we know from reporters now is not the way to go about anything, but of course the Big Ten's like, my bad, who cares, move on. Later in the first half, uh, Ohio State's attempting a long field goal, I think it was 49 yards, and here the play clock had run out for a good, at a minimum, two seconds. Some places say that it was four seconds before the ball was snapped, meaning the play clock was at zero. There should have been a stoppage of play, flag thrown, five-yard penalty, which pushes it to a 54-yard field goal, which in college isn't that common. I don't think 50-plus-yard field goals are that common, especially in a hostile environment on the road like that. Now, I'm not sure he would have been able to make it with the, the, the kick that he got off on the 49-yard field goal. The 49-yard field goal was good to give Ohio State a 10 nothing lead, but it shouldn't have even happened. It should have at least given forced them to try a 54-yarder, but no, that didn't happen. And you really have no idea how any of the officials missed that. It's just another another poor officiating job by the same crew that screwed Penn State two years ago in Nebraska on Matt Lehman's touchdown that they rule a fumble despite half the ball being across the goal line and all the replays that they could see and use. Um, but this again, this came a week or two weeks after the awful call at Michigan. Um, where they said that I believe Jesse James was offsides and no replay angle at all and any capacity showed him being anywhere near offsides on the onside kick that Penn State recovered. But again, you can't blame officiating for losses, so we'll just move past that, move on. Uh, Penn State is now four and four after their loss yesterday, uh, Saturday, November first, to Maryland. Just the second time in football in Penn State football history that the Nittany Lions fell to Maryland. And uh, they lost 20-19 to in a game that once again featured a incredible performance by both the defense and kicker Sam Ficken, who you'll remember two years ago people wanted to kill at the beginning of the year, especially against Virginia. But now Ficken is one of the most reliable um, kickers in the country and the, probably the best part of the Penn State offense. When he trots on the field, you feel like you know you're going to get scores, whereas when Hackenberg... Belton at all are out there. You just hope that they don't throw an interception or turn the ball over. The defense, an incredible job led again by Mike Hall, who it's it's criminal that he's not on more defensive player of the year watch list. Uh, it's laughable that some of them excluded him. Um, like Pat Fitzgerald said from Northwestern, he may not be on. I, I think it's the Bidneric that he wasn't on at all. or some One of them added him to it. One of them didn't or can't or won't. But whichever one that Pat Fitzgerald votes for, he said he was going to write Mike Hull's name in because of the year he's having. Uh, he had almost 20 tackles against Ohio State, plus an interception that set up Penn State's second touchdown. Uh, Hull was all over the field again on, on Saturday against the Terrapins. Most of the defense was. They were swarming. You know, they got put in bad situations by the offense time and time again. You can't expect a defense to always come up with a stop, especially sometimes the way Penn State plays. Even, you know, Tom Bradley three years ago and uh, the defensive coordinators used under um, Bill O'Brien it, it almost had that bend but don't break mentality where you're going to give up the sh short yardage you're going to play a lot of soft zone unfortunately when your offense puts you in bad situations with short field position or constant turnovers that bend but don't break ends up coming broken and not really much of the defense's fault but only giving up 20 points with an offense that features Hackerberg, Deshaun Hamilton, Geno Lewis, Bill Belton, Nikhil Lynch, Jesse James. You know, I can keep going on. You would think that Penn State would be able to score at least 21 points. Well, once again, they weren't able to do that. And uh, like I said, the Nittany Lions lose to Maryland 20-19 um, to 19 for their Penn State's fourth straight loss. 
after starting the season 4-0. I'm not going to blame sanctions or anything like that. That's just another excuse like officiating is. Uh, I'm not going to blame anyone. I'm just going to sit here and say this is the Penn State team um, that we have right now. Uh, maybe it should have been expected. After the 8-4 and season in 2012 and I think 7-5 and last year, now we're trending down 4-4 four and four here uh, with four games to play. you got to win two to become bowl eligible. Will they be able to do that? I have no idea. you got uh, Temple, Indiana, Illinois, M- Michigan State, not necessarily in that order. you got to win two of those. It would be great for them to win two of those games. you got to think that they should have a chance against Illinois. At the beginning of the year, I wasn't so sure about Indiana. Now, who knows? Temple and Michigan State, the Temple game looks like that could be a loss this year, which would be, I think, the first time that Penn State's ever lost to Temple, if that would happen. And Michigan State, I don't hold out much hope for that. Although the team was able to get up for Ohio State and hopefully um, a home atmosphere, albeit during Thanksgiving weekend when the students will all be away, uh, could help. But it's hard to say... Hard to think that Penn State's going to do better than six and six. To go three and one the rest of the way would kind of be a, a huge, huge undertaking and a huge surprise. That means most likely beating Illinois, Indiana, and Temple before falling to Michigan State. Seven and five right now would be feel like a an absolute drastic improvement over where we're at over the last month. Really, two tails of the seasons right now. First month four and zero. Second month zero and four. Now we got four more to go, two thirds of the way through. What's it going to be? A split two and two to finish six and six would actually feel pretty good. Um, seven and five would be amazing. I don't hold out any hope for eight, eight and four, especially with Michigan State likely playing for a chance to play in the national title playoff. You know, be one of those four teams in. So seven and five would be incredible. More likely, you're looking at five and seven or six and six, which. It's disappointing. I, I just hope that the recruiting class is able to stay together because Franklin and his staff, while some of their game decisions have been called into question, you can't doubt their recruiting. So hopefully they can keep that together and just keep building. You know, Once they get a full allotment of scholarships and this war of attrition stops going away from Penn State's favor, perhaps uh, Penn State will be back where we expect them to be. Already 2015 is looking to shape up as a good year because basically everyone on this team is back. Now I know some should say, well, the offensive line is terrible. You know, another year with Coach Hand and in Franklin's system, uh, another a year of experience under their belt. Perhaps things will look up in 2015. But again, we're not losing too many significant pieces on any side, either side of the ball. So 2015 could be a much better year for Penn State. And uh, that's all we can really uh, look at now. I guess the last thing I should probably address is um, the the Maryland ridiculousness uh, that was at the start of the game where they started a fracas with Penn State and then refused to shake the captain's hands, resulting in a penalty. Now, Coach Edsel says that none of that was planned and that he's disappointed and the athletic department at Maryland has come out and, and said that they didn't condone any of that and they apologized and all that crap. You know, I don't, I just don't buy into any of it. I don't think there was any respect there from the start. Um, I certainly have no respect for the University of Maryland now. They want to pull that. Even they want to come back on your, your PC bullcrap and uh, just say that you don't condone it. I never buy into any of those statements from any of these places. It just re- all rings hollow to me. You know, they wanted a rivalry. Fine, we'll give you a rivalry. But, you know, when a rivalry has you at 36-2-1, and one, it's hard to get up for it. Now, maybe we'll say, hey... When we played you as members of the Big Ten, we're 0-1, and and now we're ready to rumble. I guess I still don't think of Penn State Rutgers as a rivalry because they didn't beat us this year. Maybe because of Maryland beating us on our turf and acting the way they did, that the immaturity that they showed there. Perhaps, um, you know, perhaps Maryland will get a rival. We'll see what happens. Uh, it'll probably take a few years for this all to work out. If Penn State reels off ten wins in a row against them, will it really ma- matter? I don't know. I just. I hope our players never act the way that the Maryland players did because that was completely classless and just ridiculous. I've never seen anything anything like it for for the Penn State captains to stick out their hand and hang it there for two seconds and Maryland guys just stand there staring at them. Completely ridiculous. I st- it, just, it makes me mad just talking about it right now. I, thankfully, I didn't see it live. I had to watch it on a Vine or whatever I, I clip on, on uh, online. But Maryland, okay, whatever. Let's move on here. Let's get into some NFL action here. 
And uh, to start with Thursday night, the Saints finally got a victory here to, uh, I believe, sit on top of the awful, awful NFC South. The Saints beat the Panthers 28-10. to The Panthers haven't won pretty much as long as Penn State hasn't won. Uh, Panthers fell to 3-5-1 and um, after losing to the Saints 28-10 to at home. They just can't get anything going. There was no offense for the Panthers whatsoever. Cam Newton had the only touchdown by himself. And um, the Saints now in control of, of the South briefly. Um, and they also got help today because the Buccaneers fell to the Browns. The Buccaneers, I think, are now like 1-7. So they pose almost no threat to the Saints whatsoever. So the Saints, despite being 4-4, four and four, seem to be back where we thought they'd be at the beginning of the year. And hey, Justin mentioned this two weeks ago. If the Saints can get into the playoffs with a division title, even if it's at 8-8, eight and eight, knowing what Drew Brees and that offense is capable of and having to play in that dome in the first round because they'd be the division winner, they'd have a home field game, would you feel good about going there? I, I certainly wouldn't. Now, thankfully, my team isn't in the NFC, so I wouldn't have to worry about it. But if you're one of those teams, whatever a, a, NFC East team doesn't win, be it the Eagles or the Cowboys, as the two you're probably guessing are fighting for the NFC's title, one of them might have to go, go to New Orleans to play their first-round game. It, it, it's just the way that it is. And I know Justin said that he likes that, winning your division, getting you that home game. I didn't say it then because we ran out of time, but I don't like it. I, I don't like that you're getting rewarded for mediocrity. You're being terrible. And I know there's the other point of view saying, well, if you're so good, go there and win. And no, there's both sides to it. You know, whatever. It's not one that I'm completely passionate about. But I guess I would like to see in NFL that the best, you know, six six to eight teams make it. You see them that way. I know rivalries and all that. I just, it's just me spitballing here. But... Anyways, NFC South is terrible, but Saints beat the Panthers Thursday night. The Buccaneers lost to the Browns today. The Browns are now five and three after their victory of the Bucks, twenty-two seventeen. And um, you got to think that there's two games that got away from them: Week One against Pittsburgh, where they let Pittsburgh build a huge lead, had to fight back, and then fell at the end of the game. And then when the Browns lost, what a couple weeks ago to the Jaguars, that one's just ugh, mind-boggling. If you take that one. Cleveland's 6-2 and two, and is clearly in play for the AFC North title with Cincinnati, Baltimore, and even Pittsburgh. Now, I'm not sure how strong that division is. Are they beating up on crappy teams? Are they beating up on each other? I don't know. Even though we're at basically almost the halfway point, it's really hard to tell how good some of these AFC North teams are because one week they look good and one week they look terrible. And... Um, Speaking of the FC North, let's stay there and go to Cincinnati, where the Bengals had to they had to play a ball game against the Jaguars, which people didn't think would happen. It's just a few weeks ago, people thought Cincinnati might be the best team in the NFL. Uh, a couple of blowout losses and, and str- struggles have uh, kind of tempered those expectations, but Cincinnati should have easily beaten Jaguars today, and they had a bit of a fight. Uh, since then, they did win 33-23. to They were without Giovanni Bernard, but um, Jeremy Hill filled in admirably for him. Uh, A.J. Green made his return first game in three weeks. He had a touchdown, so the Bengals improve uh, after a win over the Jaguars, 33-23. to Now, the Ravens and Steelers actually play each other tonight in a huge game. Both teams are sitting at 5-3. and three. They already played once in Baltimore. And the Ravens got the better of Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh's coming off a huge performance last week where they beat a very good Colts team. Now, neither team could stop each other. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the exact opposite tonight where you see two defenses really respond and pitch a low-scoring game. I think because of Baltimore losing last week to Cincinnati, in Cincinnati, and now Baltimore going to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh coming off of a big win over Indy at home. So, again, Steelers two weeks in a row at home, Ravens two weeks in a row, in a row at home. But I think the Ravens are going to respond after losing to Cincinnati. I don't think they're going to let the Steelers push them around. I think the Ravens are going to bounce back and win that game tonight. I know we don't usually do predictions, but with Justin not here, I'm just kind of filling in the gaps. So, I think the Ravens get the win tonight, which would give them both wins over the Steelers this year and improve them to 6-3 and three, while the Steelers would drop to 5-4 and four and actually be a half game behind the Browns, um, which actually I think would drop Pittsburgh at 5-4 and four into last place in that division. So the AFC North is definitely taking care of business outside of their division. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that, that division does end up at the end of the year. All four teams really could say they're in the hunt for a division title. 
All right, let's look at some of the other games here. A, a, a back and forth game happened up in Minnesota with the uh, Redskins traveling there with the first game in a few weeks for Robert Griffin III. The Redskins actually had a chance to drive to tie or win the game near the end of regulation, and uh, Robert Griffin just looked horrible on, on the last series, and the Vikings were able to hold on. They win 29-26 to in a back-and-forth affair. Matt Agiata had three touchdowns for them, and the Vikings now, I think, got their fourth win of the year. I think they're 4-5 and five now, and uh, while they're probably not as talented as the Packers in the Packers or Lions in the NFC North, they definitely probably can give Chicago a run who is its idol this week. Uh, the Redskins otherwise dropped the 3-6 and six and are more than likely done in the NFC playoff picture, especially with both the Cowboys and Eagles in front of them. Okay, my team, South Florida, looking good. The Dolphins coming off a victory last week. The Chargers coming off a loss last week. Having to come across the country once more, they lay an egg. Now, I'm happy to say that because the Dolphins don't often get shutouts, nor do they often score more than 30 points. But both happened today as the Dolphins, led by Ryan Tannehill, destroyed San Diego and Phillip Rivers 37 to nothing. The Dolphins' defense, which is probably one of the most underrated in the league, was able to just control the game both off both the pass and the run. They intercepted Phillip Rivers three times. They forced a fumble by Phillip Rivers. They actually knocked Rivers out of the game as well. Uh, Kellen Clemens, I think, came in in relief for, for Rivers after the injury. I don't think it's anything serious, though. And the Dolphins just steamrolled through San Diego today, and they actually held up at the end. Some backups and reserves were playing for Miami. This was a, a huge letdown for San Diego, who was 5-1, and one. Uh, at at, the, at one point, but now they dropped to I think they're five and four now after the setback today, and they don't have an easy path with both Kansas City and Denver in their division. Whereas the Dolphins are now five and three, having already had their bye, but are in the the meat of their schedule right now. They after this win today and getting them to five and three, they have to travel to Detroit before returning home to host Buffalo, and then traveling to Denver. Um, they have a Sunday game next week at Detroit. They have a Thursday night game hosting Buffalo. And then the next week they have a Saturday, or excuse me, a Sunday evening game in Denver. You know, I, I hate to say going 500 in that stretch would be great for the Dolphins. But if Miami is able to go, uh, what, 6-5 and five through those, I think it would be. Yeah, if they would be 6-5 and five after those two, that would be great. Um, that probably that means getting a win against probably Detroit or Buffalo. I, I just don't see how Miami can compete with Denver. Um, but after that is cleared, the Dolphins get a break against the Jets. You hope it's a break against them because the Jets just seem to be awful. But when it comes to division games, you never can, can take them lightly. They play the Jets December 1st and December 28th. And sandwiched in between those games, they host Baltimore, travel to New England, which I'll be at, and then host the Vikings. So it's nice to finish the last two games of the year at home, December 21st and 28th, against teams that probably won't be in playoff contention. Now, the teams won't have anything to lose, and Miami will have everything to gain, which last year when the Dolphins were 8-6, and six, they lost the last two games, needing to win at least one to make the playoffs. Hopefully that's not the same case this year. Uh, but the Dolphins are 5-3 and three after beating down the Chargers today 37-0. The, the Jets that I just mentioned got lost again today. I believe it's their 7th consecutive loss, maybe more 8th consecutive. Yeah, 8th consecutive. They started the season 1-0 and and have now dropped, dropped 8 straight. That's never happened in the history of the Jets franchise until today. The Chiefs beat them 24-10. to The Eagles went to Houston, first time traveling to the state of Texas this year. And escaped with a win, 31 to 21. But they lost two key players on their team, in quarterback Nick Foles, who was replaced by Mark Sanchez and played well. You know, I'm a huge Sanchez detractor, but he played well this game. But I wouldn't hold out much hope of things going forward. Nick Foles has a clavicle injury. As last I knew, it hadn't been announced if it was broken or not yet. Uh, if it is, he he'll miss four to six weeks, which means he probably wouldn't be back until the last three weeks of the season and would miss at least one, if not both, games against the Cowboys. Maybe the bigger injury is D'Amico Ryans, the quarterback of the Eagles' defense, went down with a supposedly an Achilles tear, the opposite ankle from the one he tore in Houston, uh, coincidentally, um, like six years ago. 
Uh, I believe D'Amico Ryan's tore his left Achilles for the Texans, missed an entire year, and two years later he's sent to the Eagles. And now after landing in Philly and returning to Houston for a game against the Texans, he tears his other Achilles, his right Achilles, and he will be lost for the remainder of the season. Why could that be a bigger loss than Foles? Well, you saw Sanchez fill in and do a nice job. The Eagles have nothing else at linebacker. Casey Matthews just is nothing like his brother. He just... He's just awful. Again, even in there with Michael Kendricks, who also can't seem to stay healthy. The Eagles' defense has played admirably in situations that the offense has put them in, much like Penn State at times this year. The Eagles' defense has had to step up for an ineffective offense at times. But losing D'Amico Ryan's their their guy that they turn to to lead them for the rest of the season that one hurts. So we'll see how the Eagles are able to respond with their. Um, injuries, but they got the victory today. They improved to six and two, and they saw their rival, the Cowboys, drop to the Cardinals, who apparently are the best team in possibly the NFL. Uh, you could definitely make that argument today as they move uh, to, I think they're seven and one now. Yeah, the Cardinals are seven and one, which is absolutely incredible. That NFC West, you know, we said at the beginning of the year, everyone thought that that NFC West was a strong division, and and I agreed. I said the 49ers would struggle. I thought the Seahawks would take a step back, but I thought the Rams would, would jump up and be the team. Well, it looks like I got the Cardinals and Rams confused because um, I'm definitely right about the 49ers and Seahawks to date. But Arizona, after squeaking by San Diego, San Diego the first week, then going to New York and beating down on the Giants and the 49ers before ultimately falling to the Broncos, have now reeled off four wins in a row against the Redskins, the Raiders, the Eagles, and the Cowboys. So they beat two, two weeks in a row. They beat NFC contenders uh, in the Eagles and the Cowboys. And this week they went to Dallas to do it. Now I know the Cowboys were missing Tony Romo. Obviously a huge loss. Brandon Whedon was pretty terrible in the game today. I think um, Des Bryant had just not even a handful of catches. He got that one late touchdown, but the Cardinals were able to shut him down for the most part. Uh, and Dallas drops to 5-3, and three, has lost two games in a row now after falling to the Redskins last week, and now Arizona. They're now a half game behind the Eagles, and Dallas, I think, may have a bye this week or next. If it's not this coming week, it's the next week. Let's just quick check their schedule here. Uh, the Eagles, or excuse me, the Cowboys, no, the Cowboys actually have to go to London and play Jacksonville before having a bye. Um, so Dallas gets uh, Jacksonville this coming week, and they need to rebound and get back on the win, in the win column. Uh, after reeling off, what, five victories in a row, they've now lost two straight. Uh, and with a lot of important NFC games the rest of the year, actually only one game left on Dallas's schedule after the game in London is versus an AFC team. Once they get back from their bye the weekend before Thanksgiving, they travel to the Giants, then host the Eagles on Thanksgiving night, travel to Chicago, travel back to Philadelphia, host the Colts, and then travel to Washington to finish the year. So uh, Dallas definitely has to get their act together, and Tony Romo needs to heal up his back injury, apparently pretty significant. Um, but I'd expect him to be back for the November 23rd game against the Giants. Okay. Couple more games left here. All going on at this moment. Big week of buys, so not as big a game. The Bills, Titans, Bears, Lions, Packers, Falcons all have buys this week. In late evening action, uh, the Rams are in San Francisco. The Rams two and five. 49ers four and three. They're all tied up. Um, approaching the end of the third quarter. So fourth quarter is getting ready to start out in San Francisco, and it's ten to ten. Rams holding tough, playing the 49ers at home. Uh, you know, I sh I'm thinking this week that this could be an upset. And I, of course, I don't pick it. I go with San Francisco. But the Rams have played the 49ers very, very tough the f few years that uh, Harbaugh has been the 49ers head coach. They actually tied either last year or the year before one of the games. And while well, this was the years that the 49ers were doing their runs, um, you know, making the NFC title game three years, and the Rams have played them notoriously tough. Again, 10-10 tie in San Francisco entering the fourth quarter. The Seahawks are all over the Raiders. They're up 21, um, but it looks like the third quarter just started there. Wow, the San Francisco game is really moving along. They're almost in the fourth quarter, whereas the Raiders-Seahawks game just came back from halftime with the Seahawks up 24-3. to So you'd expect the, the Seahawks are probably rolling that one, get another win, improve to 5-3, and three, where the Raiders will be the last winless team. They'll be 0-8 if that should happen again. 
Okay, the, uh, the the game of the week, game of the century, or whatever you want, the media wants to hype it up, is happening in New England. And at halftime, the Patriots are all over the Broncos. It's 27-7. to Denver led 7-3 to after the first quarter, but the Patriots ex- exploded for 24 points in the second. Uh, that's how you get to the score, 27-7. to I know uh, the Broncos at 6-1. and Peyton Manning already had one interception in the first quarter. I don't know what happened in the second quarter. Uh, but the Patriots at 6-2. and This is... It's not a playoff in terms that the the loser is done, but it's for seeding here. This would give the Broncos a second loss. The Patriots would actually have a half game lead because they haven't had a bye yet. This would put New England um, in play for the number one overall seed in the AFC. It, funny, just a month ago, everyone was freaking out uh, about the Patriots and what they've done since they played the Bengals on Monday night. It has kind of been extraordinary. Tom Brady is back to being his old self, which is Awful, awful news for me as a Dolphins fan, and I'll get to see him and Gillette uh, firsthand in, in about a month or so. So that's all your late games. I already talked about the Sunday night game. Last one to talk about is the Monday night game, and this is a huge game for really both squads involved. The Colts are at 5-3. and three. After starting the season 0-2, they reeled off five straight wins, but then Indianapolis went to Pittsburgh last week and just their defense couldn't stop anyone and relied on, on Luck to get it ju- done. He had some, but not enough to beat the Steelers last week to drop Indy to 5-3. and three. Now, the Giants coming off their bye week, they need a win to somewhat keep pace in the NFC East. The Eagles got the win today. Dallas lost. Giants get the win the Giants are only one game behind uh, the Cowboys, who are sitting at five and three. So the Giants definitely need this victory tonight to just put a little pressure on Dallas. If they lose this evening, that's two at least two games back of a potential wild card berth in the NFC. Uh, it's something that uh, Tom Coughlin probably doesn't need another home loss. The Giants have been actually better on the road under with Eli and Tom Coughlin than they generally are at home. This one's at home against the Colts who are coming off that bad loss to the Steelers. I'd expect Indianapolis to win this game tonight. I think the Colts are the better team. But a Colts loss here, that also makes it interesting as well because they dropped to 5-4. and four, And despite the Texans losing today and the Titans being idle, 5-4 and four <clears throat> would, would mean the Texans are only one game back. So there's still a lot to play for on both sides. Obviously, we're only halfway through the season. And um, Houston and Indianapolis don't play until um, week 15, uh, December 14th. So they still do have a head-to-head matchup to go. But a big game for both the Colts and Giants tomorrow night. The uh, They both uh, need a win to keep pace or to get, give themselves some distance in the playoff race. All right, no emails or anything that I can see. I don't think there's anything left to mention in the NFL world. Let me just double check here, see if there's any announcements or anything. Looks like that's about it. <clears throat> All right, a couple birthdays that are coming up this week that I just want to give a little shout out here. Um, this Wednesday, November 5th, actually, one of my friends. Um, And Chad Henney's brother-in-law, Chris, has a birthday, so happy birthday to him. Same day, my father-in-law, Kelly's dad, Ken, has a birthday as well. Happy birthday to him. Some of Kelly's friends, back-to-back, Chelsea and Mike, birthday shout-outs for them as well. And uh, I'm excited to say that next weekend, um, hopefully after a Wilson win in the first round of district playoffs, Kelly and I will be hosting... uh, the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences canners, which are related to the Penn State Dance Marathon. They're coming down here to West Lawn to, to uh, do their fundraising on the street corners with their cans to um, collect change and cash and whatever people will give them in the fight against pediatric cancer. So next weekend, Saturday and Sunday morning, if you see people dancing around, chanting FTK, talking about Thon, um, hyping up Penn State Dance Marathon, definitely uh, be kind and courteous, and you don't have to donate, but if you have anything you can, throw it in their can. Um, We'll be hosting them here. We'll have eight college students living with us for two days, so that will be an interesting time in the Mays household for sure. I think that's everything. So um, had a little technical difficulties with the music, so probably just going to leave you here in silence. 
Uh, that wraps up the 153rd episode of the Joe Mays and JF Show. I'm Joe Mays. We'll see you next week for episode 154. Hopefully, JRoff will be back. Until next time, I'm Joe Mays. Thanks for listening.